Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. We have now verified the angulation and orientation of our implant placement utilizing our radiographic guide, and we will now proceed to make the surgical guides themselves. When it comes to making the surgical guides, you proceed to the extreme left side of the box that the drills and drill blanks come in and you see that they have sizes of 2.2 millimeters, 2.8 millimeters, 3.5 millimeters, and 4.2 millimeters. We'll just be fabricating the surgical guides for the 2.2, the 2.8, and the 3.5 sizes. So what I'm going to do now is to take the 2.2 millimeter diameter drill. We're going to place the surveyor table on the drill press and use the drill press to drill a hole in the appropriate location and orientation for our 2.2 surgical guide. Off camera, we used a drill press to drill a 2.2 millimeter diameter hole in our cast and that is at the orientation and location we had determined for our implant placement. In the box of drills that we get, there are also drill blanks. We're going to remove the drill from the hole we have made and insert the drill blank. We will then proceed with making our surgical guide. And here again, I usually take my strip of triad that's about one inch wide, roll it in the palms of my hand, until I make it elongated worm and place it on the occlusal surface of my cast. Here again, if I press down with my finger, I'm not trying to wrap it over the buckle or labial of the teeth, but incidentally, if it happens to creep over just a little, that's fine, but I do not want the surgical guide to come very far over the buckle or labial of the teeth. I can also take either a buffalo knife or the handle of my scalpel, my 11 blade, and press the triad down toward the occlusal surfaces of the teeth, adapting it very well at the occlusal and adapting it real thoroughly at the lingual. When viewed from the buckle, one thing I do want to have in my surgical guide is I want very good adaptation at the lingual 180 degrees of the drill blank. And one of the tools that's very nice for achieving this is the large Peter K. Thomas instrument. And I take my finger and just brace the lingual aspect of my drill guide. I can mold the triad material so that I'm sure it gets a real nice adaptation so that I feel very confident that I have the lingual 180 degrees of the drill blank well adapted with the triad material. I don't want my drill guide, my surgical guide, to be any taller than the teeth are by more than one to one and a half millimeters at the most, preferably less. The reason that you don't want your, your surgical guide to be a lot taller than the teeth is when the surgeon is in with their drill, drilling down, placing their osteotomy, if the surgical guide is too thick occlusally, the head of their handpiece hits the top of your drill guide and their hole isn't as deep as it needs to be. So keeping this thin in the area where they'll be placing the implant is critical. The other aspect we want to be careful of is we don't want this area lingual to the drill blank to be too thin. We don't want the lingual aspect of our drill guide to go down on the palate very far. Because during surgery, they're going to lay a flap. And if part of our drill guide extends down palatally, the seating of the drill guide may be difficult because this area right to the lingual of where they're placing their implant may interfere with their flap. So we have good adaptation at the lingual. We cover the occlusal surfaces. We wrap around the lingual aspect of our drill blank very intimately for the lingual 180 degrees. We're now going to place this in the curing oven and cure this for four minutes. 
we have good adaptation on the occlusal surfaces, and remember that we want to extend our surgical guide from one or two teeth distal to our edentulous space around to the bicuspids of the opposite side so it may be stabilized well clear of our surgical area. So here again what we would use is a pair of pliers to remove the drill blank first and I want to first twist and remove the drill blank. What we're doing now is we're looking carefully at the underside of this and you can see where we have gripped a little more than the lingual 180 degrees of our surgical guide. Now this brings up a good point for us in that you can see on the underside of the drill guide right here I have fractured off a small area of our model. So at this point I take an instrument and I pick out the stone that had fractured into my surgical guide. What I'm now going to do is take our slow speed straight handpiece and relieve any sharp areas that I feel with my finger. It may be difficult to see on camera. What I try to do is look in the long axis right down the drill guide and you can see when you look down the long axis of the drill guide uh, that where the triad surrounded the lingual 180 degrees of the drill blank, it actually went more than 180, so there's a constriction. And what I'm trying to do with my drill now is to just open up that constriction so that my drill blank can freely pass in and out from the buckle and not be constricted where that little narrow aspect is. When I've done that, what I want to do is to check my surgical guide repeatedly with the drill blank that I have. That when it's firmly placed in, it has no mesiodistal tilt at all. And it freely comes in and out from the buckle. So those are our requirements from our surgical guide, is that it fits in a stable fashion on the occlusal surfaces of the teeth for our patient. The drill blank passes in and out from the buckle aspect freely. Again, I always check this carefully by holding one end and threading it up from the bottom or down from the top, making sure that there's no resistance to its removal at all. So this would complete the fabrication of our smaller drill guide for the 2.2 millimeter drill. The next drill we would move to is the next size of our surgical drill, which is a 2.8 drill. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.